Amen. Amen. So I, how many of you were blessed last week? It's so, so, so good. The teaching, the, the scriptures. How many of you, it, for you, it wasn't what you actually expected? It was a lot of word, a lot of scripture, a lot of teaching from the word. And he didn't so much talk about money, right? But just all the principles of kingdom finances. It's all in the word of God. I love it. The, the word of God is so rich. So we just want to welcome Ron again up here. Ron, if you could come up. Ron, a little bit about Ron. He spent many years as, I'm not going to do a good job announcing him, but as a senior consultant of Northwestern Mutual. Correct me if I'm wrong. They're the biggest insurance company in, in the States. Sort of depends how you measure it. Or, or the much. world. <laughs> yeah. Much. So he's got a lot of experience in, in, in this field, and we're just so blessed. Again, true teacher gift and true teacher anointing in the house. So welcome him again. All right, is that working okay? I was going to pray again, but since I was going to pray for wisdom and revelation, I'm not touching that. That's what he prayed for. But by the way, I mean, the continuity of the Spirit is amazing. I was literally going to use those words. That's what I was thinking as I was sitting down. And then you said wisdom and revelation. That's, that's what we all want. So I am going to pray. Father God, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you for you knowing what it is we need to hear. And Father, I just pray right now that our our ears would hear, our eyes would see, our hearts would be open to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name. So I started last time and I, I, I read you some stats about, sadly, the state of finances in this country. Um, I'm not going to go through those stats again. I think everybody got the idea that, that we really, sadly, are not well prepared financially for our futures, but it need not be that way. And that is the whole purpose of what we've been talking about. And uh, we started off with the principles, and we are actually going to get into some numbers next week. But those numbers, the discussion about the things to actually do in your own personal financial situation, it's not going to take, it's not going to work if we don't understand these foundational principles. And if we don't not just understand them, but own them in our heart. I'm going to talk about that today, too, which is we really have to have it right on our lips, some of these scriptures. Um, otherwise, the moment the wind starts blowing, the moment there's a storm, we're going to forget a lot of the things that we've learned and we're, we're, we're going to be in trouble. We have to depend on the Lord. So let's start with the first slide. It was just a quick summary of the principles from last week. Those are hopefully going up. There we go. Uh, so, other than the fact that principle is still spelled wrong, that's okay. That was a, that was a test. This is the principle that you got in trouble with, Rich, when you were a kid. <laughs> oh, and Tim Page as well. So, the other principles, P-L-E-S, fear the Lord and delight in his commandments. So, we talked about these things, and as David said, these don't seem to have a lot to do with finance. But what we learned last week was all of these were very well connected to finance in Scripture. And that's why I honed in on these. Uh, we have not because we ask not. Putting God first, right? That was the whole, it isn't money that's evil, it's the love of money. Praying into the promises that he gives us, not dwelling on all the negative problems that we have. Understanding that God really owns everything. That keeps us very, very humble. We need to be. Uh, and that's the next point. Uh, be careful not to be proud of whatever wealth we do have. We are only stewards. These all flow together. Being stewards of what we have so that God will, can honor us with wealth when he understands and knows that we understand how to take care of what he has already given us. And so we talked about um, the father, son, or daughter principle, right? You wouldn't want to give your kids wealth if they weren't able to handle it, and our Father works the same way. Um, we talked about 
relying on God versus ourselves, not over accumulating or hoarding, and those are things we do if we are in fear. We talked about planning for future generations, the Bible is specific about that, and of course taking care of others, especially the poor. These are all things that really are important principles to wealth. And then we talked a lot about and had good questions on watching out for the spirit of poverty, which shows up in so many uh, different ways, as we talked about. And you need to really do some self-examination to make sure that you are not under the sway of that spirit, which can really prevent you from getting all that God has for you in this life right now. And then finally, the importance and practice of renewing our minds. I just mentioned that as a principle, but that's where we're going to start today, um, is talking about the renewal of our minds. And, you know, this may, everybody's, I think, aware of the importance of that. It's certainly in Scripture. But you may not think of that as necessarily being linked to our finances, but it is. Um, and, you know, if you've grown up in the world system of prosperity, we sometimes have to unlearn some things. And when we unlearn those things, we are, in effect, renewing our minds, substituting the world's ideas with kingdom principles. So let's look at uh, Third John in the second chapter. Uh, beloved, is that going up? There we go. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So just a quick review here. We understand that our soul is our mind, our will, and emotions. And a prosperous soul is filled with God's word, certainly, but it doesn't necessarily start out that way. Remember that we're made in God's image, so we are triune. Uh, we have a spirit which was perfected when we became born-again Christians. That spirit was dead and was perfectly regenerated. Uh, and we have a body representing our flesh, and then we have the soul, as I say, which is the mind, will, and emotion, and that is going through this process. So when it says in this scripture, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers, we are actually getting to the point that our prosperity is in effect linked to how our soul is prospering. So there's an aspect of this, and there are other scriptures too. Let's look at Psalm 19.7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. So as we conform our souls, we begin to adopt God's laws of prosperity. So the less soulish we are, the more prosperous we can be. So if we look at the next verse of, uh, in 3 John, verse 3, we're going to continue in, in not just the soul prospering, but now we get to the truth. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you just as you walk in truth. So it further suggests that in order for the soul to prosper, that truth is critical. And where do we find the truth, of course, is in the word. And that is how we can begin to renew our minds. So you see how this is all coming together. We prosper under God's laws of prosperity to the degree we fill our hearts with these laws, allowing for the soul to prosper, and as we obey them day to day. Meanwhile, one of the blocks is our worldly traditions. And that's something we have to keep in mind as we are going through this process. The part of your soul that is maybe sinful or not following God's law, that's the part that we need to be working on, right? So Mark 7, 13, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down and many such things that you do. So the traditions of men, let me just rattle off some of them in the finance area, when we rely totally on ourselves, the idea that one has to win at all costs or conduct business using bribes, I've actually run into people who say, hey, you know, I operated my business in a country and required bribes in order to work there. It was the way they did things. It wasn't the way we did things, but we, we had to do it. No, we don't have to do it. 
Um, there are other inappropriate behaviors that people make excuses for, but those are the kinds of traditions that can block us from prosperity. So when we are working in our fields, when we're working in our day-to-day -day lives, we cannot compromise and do things. They may be small in the world's view, they may even be appropriate in the world's view, but our standard has to be the word. So part of renewing our minds, replacing those traditions with the word, and as Pastor Tricia said last week, change our stinking thinking. God doesn't think about financial shortages, by the way, and neither should we. So in talking about thinking, um, that would be really doubt and unbelief if we're focusing on that. So part of renewing our mind, too, is what are we thinking about day to day? Um, I, you know, I'd much rather think about things like the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, I, I, the Lord says I have plans to prosper you. Um, lean not on your own understanding, unless you're starting to understand this, then I want you to lean on it. <laughs> okay. I also want to remind us that there are, of course, no problems that are impossible for God, as it says in uh, Matthew 19.26. And Philippians uh, 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So fill yourselves with these scriptures. Let your mind dwell on those. Declare them over your life, church. It's what we really need to be focusing on. Not the financial things that are coming down the pike. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do things about those financial problems, but where's your mind, where's your focus? Okay. I want to go back to Philippians 4.8, move ahead rather to Philippians 4.8, because as we don't want to just think about things we shouldn't think about, let's talk about what it says in God's word that we should focus on. Whatever things are true, whatever are noble, things are just, whatever things are pure, things are, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And I want to really talk about meditation. This is my bridge into that. Um, this is really all part of spiritual disciplines that I think are really important in renewing our minds. So spiritual disciplines like fasting, prayer, meditation. Uh, my, one of my favorite scriptures is Joshua 1.8. Keep this book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night that you may be careful to do everything in it then you will be. Ready for this? This is the only scripture in the Bible that gives you a condition of how to be prosperous and successful. The only place where both of those things are there. Are there. So we meditate, speak it, memorize it so we can obey it. When we memorize the scripture, what does it do? It actually goes from the head to the heart, right? That's what, that's what memorizing scripture can really, really do for you. I'm a big fan of it. Because you get into a situation, you've got the go-to, what you need to turn to. I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But let's go to Psalm uh, 1, verses 1 through 3. This is a huge conditional statement coming up here. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of, scorn, of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law he meditates, there we go, day and night, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now, pulling that apart, listen to the conditional statements in there. Basically, I cut it, if I cut it, all those verses down, and I think you can only see one at a time, and that's okay. Um, if a man keeps good counsel, if he del or woman, <laughs> if he delights in the law, if he meditates on the word, those three things, then whatever he does shall prosper. Take that seriously. The counsel's really important. We're gonna talk about, one of the topics next week is like the 15 financial myths that are out there. Bad counsel that people are saying. I want to disavow you of bad counsel. <laughs> All 
all right? So you can use those things. If you have a financial counselor, start asking them about those myths and see how they answer them. That'll be a nice little litmus test to find out whether you're getting good counsel. But that's to make you come next week. Okay, back to meditation. 1 Timothy 4.15, meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them that you may progress and it, uh, that your progress may be evident to all. So what do we mean, what do, what do we mean by meditation? I, I love going to Greek and Hebrew. You're gonna see me do that when we get to the tithing section. I think it really can clarify um, what, what's in the word, the cultural context. Remember we talked about last time, the, the gates. Um, it was harder for a rich man to uh, go through the eye of a needle. And we talked about the, the gates. There's a cultural context as well as a scriptural context. After understanding the context, what is God trying to tell me in the scripture? What might I actually be doing differently both now and, and maybe in the future because of it. So really trying to think actively scripture in my day to day. That's, I'll tell you what you don't do. Don't do what they do in Eastern mysticism where they tell you to empty your minds. Don't do that, okay? That's really bad stuff out there. I mean, uh, you know, I hate to say it. I don't, I don't wanna, uh, I, there may be people that do yoga, but some of these yoga positions are not good. You're actually, some of the yoga positions are actually bowing down to gods that are not the God, they're demonic. Be really careful. Anything that tells you to clear your mind, because that's opening a door, right? So be really careful about that stuff. If you empty your mind, you can open the door to unhealthy baggage, we don't need that. So. Summary, head, head knowledge of these laws of prosperity is not sufficient. Just like, look, the knowledge that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that's not sufficient for salvation. The devil knows that, right? You have to actually trust in Christ. You're actually putting your life in his hands. It's the same thing here, okay? We can't just have knowledge of what these principles are. We have to, we have to own them in our heart. We have to believe them, and we have to rely on them. Proverbs 23, seven makes this pretty clear. For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. And Deuteronomy 11.18, therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Now my Jewish friends, have you ever seen the tefillin? Anybody ever seen an airport? You see some, sometimes some Jewish folks have these little boxes on their heads and, okay, that's actually from that scripture. So what they're doing is they're taking scripture, putting them in little boxes and putting them on their front lips in between their eyes and also wrapping it on their hands. But what's the problem with that? You're doing exactly what it says in the word, but it's not in your heart. And maybe it is in heart for some of them. It can be. But I think knowing folks that do that, it's really more, hey, this is the thing we do. To, you know, we're showing that we're keeping God's law. What did Jesus say? It's what's in the heart that really matters. So I'm, I'm digressing there a little bit. Okay. Psalm 112, I, I could be wrong on this. I think that's the, put that one up. Do you have, did you have Psalm 112 up there? Maybe not. Uh, when the word of God is in our hearts, there is no fear. So fear we talked about last week, buying gold, all of those things. But what if the so-called wealth transfer that everybody talks about will be manifest when we begin to adopt God's principles for prosperity? I really don't think you're, we're all gonna see sudden bank deposits coming out of nowhere. But I do think if we strength, if we fortify our hearts and fill it with God's word, I think your bank account's got a much better chance to receive what it is that God has for you. So think of, think of your minds a little bit like computers and think of your heart like data storage, okay? So if there are economic problems that are happening in your life, you can pull the scripture out for the laws of prosperity, pull it right out of your heart, 
Act on faith based on what the word says, not what they tell you on late night television, which is like buying gold and Bitcoin. That's real financial peace, by the way. And if we do that, then we can get to Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests may be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. By the way, how do we know if we're succeeding? So I said the minds are like computers, the heart is like data storage. How about your tongue being like the monitor? Okay? By the way, James 3.8 gives us a warning. No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So let's be careful. But what comes out of our mouth is an indication of what we have in our hearts. So as we go through this process of meditating on scripture and then memorizing the word seeing it go into our heart, it then comes out of our mouth, right? So that's like the whole process of it. And that's why we wanna do all of those things. Uh, Isaiah 55, 11. And by the way, even though we have to be careful of our tongue, remember the tongue never returns void or the word never returns void. And looking at Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. I think that's, that's interesting too. Okay, let's move on. And um, the next slide, I think, is a review of the principles but we're not gonna do that. Let's move to instead Matthew 7, 24, 27. So this is uh, principle 14, which is practice or doing God's word, okay? So this is a little bit like principle one, but we're getting now, we're moving a little bit more into action orientation. Remember next week, we're gonna do more action. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock, which we sang today, by the way. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house and it fell and its fall was great. So this is emphasizing the importance of what we actually do, and when we fail to do it, we're really on that foundation of sand. And when the economy trembles, we are not gonna be able to stand if we're not on a firm foundation. So I think uh, James 1.22 says, be doers of the word. Uh, and, and there's also, by the way, you have it up there, uh, doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. When we fill our mouths and our hearts with the word, we can do the word and be obedient. And there is a concept of surrendering here. So we've been given this regenerated spirit and this soul or a new heart, which is enabling us to walk in his statutes. And Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them then you shall dwell in the land I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. So this is a God enabled thing. We cannot on our own power uh, do all of these things to be financially secure, practicing all of these principles, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can. That's why I love grace being defined as God's enabling power. So yes, not on our own, but on the, on the strength of the Spirit. And it even says that, uh, Philippians 2.13, this is in the Amplified. For it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. And as we do, we, we get blessed. Okay. I'm going to skip a little bit ahead. I actually am gonna move way ahead to principle 15. And this is the law of sowing and reaping, okay? 
We'll start with Mark 4, 26 and 27. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should keep by night and raise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. Galatians 6, 7 says, for whatever a man sows, he will also reap. What does that mean? Corn seeds produce corn. And we can apply this to every level of our lives. If you want more love from your spouse, give your spouse some love. It works every time. Uh, the golden rule is from Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And in verse 20, it says, by our fruits we know them. So another way of saying is that from the harvest, we can tell what kind of seed was planted. If it's good seed, it's good fruit. If it's bad seed, it's bad fruit. If we're going to be angry and judgmental toward others, it's going to come back right back to you, either directly uh, or even self-directed sometimes. Obadiah 115 says, as you have done, so shall it be done to you. I know I'm hitting you with lots of scripture, but I want everything that I say to be supported in the word. So seed, time, and harvest is a major part of sowing and reaping, okay? And I'm going to summarize it with five key principles of seed, time, and harvest. Really simple, but I think if you keep these five in mind, it'll, it'll make sense. The first one is, we kind of talked about it, you get what you plant or you sow. Or the Bible says you reap what you sow. And that's, uh, as we said, true positive or negatively. Um, and I also want to state kind of the obvious. If you do not sow anything, you're not going to reap anything, <laughs> okay? But understand that we begin with a significant advantage. Galatians 3.16 uh, explains in verse 30 that we are blessed through the seed of Abraham, which is also through Christ. So through our faith in Christ, we're actually entitled to blessings, we can own the promise that was given to Abraham because of Christ. So having faith in Christ, in effect, is a condition of Abraham's blessing and produces those blessings for us. So you could say it this way. Every seed contains the DNA passed through generations, right? So as Isaac received his blessings through Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, we're entitled as well, not not by who we are, but whose we are, that is Christ. So that's the first principle. The second one is the principle of seed time and harvest. We reap the good harvest if we stay at it, if we persevere. Right? If we plant seeds but we don't do anything, what happens? Weeds come in, animals come in, the garden starts to look pretty bad, and we don't reap much, if anything at all. So we gotta be diligent. Right? We have to, when we plant seeds, we have to keep the animals out, fertilize. Um, so if you, if you want to see your harvest, stay at it. I think a good example was Isaac. Isaac sowed into a famine in, in Genesis chapter 26. He planted seed and received a hundredfold in that very year. So he sowed into a bad condition to change things. So that we should keep that in mind. You may be in a bad situation financially. You should continue to uh, consider your tithe. Uh, when they're not going well, you actually might want to consider shifting into extra service or giving mode. So when we plant a seed, as far as this principle is, is uh, concerned, consider what actions you can take to cultivate. For example, if you sow into a ministry, do you also pray for the ministry? I mean, seriously pray for it. Right? That's part of the cultivation of the seed that you have put there. Don't just, okay, I, I, I supported that ministry. I'll move on and take a look. No. You need to pray, pray for it. You may even be able to help it. Maybe you have some connection that could help that ministry. So th those are cultivating tools that you can do to, to, so that your seed will actually have tremendous kingdom impact. And then have the patience, which is the next principle. You reap in a different season than you sow. Right? You plant in the spring, but you harvest in the summer. Right. Right. And I think there's two harvest and planting seasons in Israel, but we won't get into that. 
but it does take some time. Genesis 8.22 says, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So by the way, think about your financial situation today. It might not be a bad idea to think about what seeds you may have planted months or years ago that may have something to do with whatever condition you're in, both good or bad. Because that's part of the principle. So what we sowed in two couple years ago, we're, maybe we're seeing the effect of that. Fourth principle. Oh, by the way, the financial part of this, God's wonderful invention of compound interest. So when we plant a seed, as far as an investment is concerned, and we give it time, that's how compound interest benefits us. So I'll just throw that in there. Again, that's a next week topic. Okay, the fourth principle of seed time and harvest is we generally reap more than we sow. We talked about positive and negative, but Galatians 5, 9, a little leaven works through the whole batch. So as frightening as that is, when we sin a little, it can grow and become a problem. It works the other way too. When you sow for good things, your harvest will be more bountiful, especially if you cultivate it as we talked about, and if you have the patience. The last principle, oh, oh, let me, before we leave that one, think about the original sowing that happened when Adam and Eve failed and God declared that the seed born of a woman, which is not normally where the seed would come from, was going to crush the head of the serpent, right? So that was a uh, prophecy about Jesus Christ. Why was it the head of the serpent? Because Satan had just gained headship of the world through that original sin, and now through the seed and fullness of time, the world would be redeemed through Christ. Galatians 4.4. By the way, when Mary was told that she was going to bring forth a son, the bring forth, that word bring forth, is from the Greek tikto, which literally means fruit produced from seed. And now, as for time, it took 4,000 years. That was time well worth waiting. The last principle, we keep, we reap in proportion to what we have sown. It's a little bit like the other one, but in general, it's true of our harvest. If you want to see a large harvest in your life, both physically and spiritually, then sow accordingly. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reach uh, will also reap bountifully. You know, when a farmer has problems with his crops, he doesn't stop putting seed in the ground. He puts more seed in the ground. So we're going to keep that in mind. He doesn't eat the seed either, by the way. He puts it in the ground. Some of the seed is edible, but he knows that if he puts it in the ground, he's going to reap from it. All right, so let's apply this a little bit more to our finances um, Ephesians 6, 8, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. I don't remember exactly why I put that in, but it's a good scripture. They're all good. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make, oh, this, um, listen to the words of abundance that you're going to see in here. God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come in abundance to you so that you may always, under the circumstance, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient in him, and have an abundance for every good and work and act of charity. Look at all the positive words in that scripture. All, always, abound, abundance, every... Uh, note, though, that it says... In the very first part of that verse, um, it, you don't have to back up. It said, God is able to do all of these things. So what we want to do is turn the God is able to God will provide. And how do we do this? Well, in two verses prior to that, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, it says, I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Sorry, I didn't tell you that was 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, 
that you always have all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. So we give and we sow, we allow God to multiply. He doesn't need our money, but he can only multiply what we sow, not what we retain. Okay. The world says we should save, and I'm not saying you shouldn't save money, you should. But I also talked last week about fear, and I do know people that save everything they get their hands on. So we want to start talking about tithing, which can help you at least give you a gauge to, to begin with your giving process. And that sh can and should grow later on, but at least this will allow God to multiply your seed. And by the way, we actually don't want to be tithing Christians. What do I mean by that? Actually, what I mean by that is don't give 10% of your life to Christ. Okay? You can give 10% of your money, but not your life. All right? We should, give we should give all of our lives to Christ. So we don't want to be tithing. This is the first time you'll ever hear someone say, don't be a tithing Christian. But you know how I mean it now. And of course, the greatest example of giving is in John 3.16, right? He gave himself for us. And by the way, what was the result of that? It was literally the harvest of millions of souls. So that incredible gift that he gave himself resulted in that and all of us here today. John 12, 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new life. So the only way for a seed to grow is to be buried in the ground and die, and then it grows and comes to life. And it's the same with us. We have to die to self too. And our money must, in effect, die. Our money dies when you give it away, right? In, in a sense, it's not, it's not there producing for you anymore. So we have to let it go, and that's how we plant it. Um, people expect to make heavenly withdrawals without depositing in the bank of heaven. I heard one preacher talk about, literally talk about the bank of heaven. We make deposits in our tithes and offerings, and we make sure to make requests when we need specific requests sometimes. Those are withdrawals from the bank, the heavenly bank. I kind of like that. Okay. One more thing, think about the Great Commission, right? To go all through all the world and preach the gospel, make disciples. That may actually not be fully be our calling to go out to the world, but we can, with our tithes and offerings in the right places, can actually impact the Great Commission that way. That's something to think about too, right? All right, how much? Let's go to principle 16, tithes and offerings. By the way, when I get into the middle of this, we're actually going to take an offering. <laughs> it's a good time. All right, tithes and offering. The purpose is to put God first. Tithing is a tenth, but it is the first tenth, also called the first fruits. So Deuteronomy 14, 23, you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. But here's something that I want you to think about. Um, first, I want to read through Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. This is the classic um, verse about providing your first fruits. Honor the Lord with God with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So th that is, and I alluded to this last week and I wanna get into this now, uh, describing a cycle of honor and blessing that occurs between us and the Lord. So honor is from the Hebrew word kabod, which actually means to be heavy, uh, numerous, rich, honorable, to be weighty, to glorify. And the word for possessions is hon, which is wealth, substance, but also like the complete person, as in a high status or as in being honorable. And so this word is much more than wealth. It's really who we are. So we honor the Lord with possessions and who we are 
Regarding possessions, the Lord has already provided them because he honors us by having given to us all that we possess in the first place. The root word of possessions is the Hebrew own, which again refers to wealth, but also to strength and substance. So in Luke 27, which is from Deuteronomy 6, when we love the Lord our God with all your heart, soul, strength, with your mind and your neighbor as yourself, you are getting to the heart of the right relationship with God. When you give to the kingdom, you are actually partnering with God to love your neighbor. Think about this. Think of the connection between your giving and the love of your neighbor. You are literally loving God when you give. And he loves us back with blessings. And I don't know how much we, we think of the giving in this sort of love honor cycle. But the very first word of the Bible, Bereshit, which is in the beginning, is from the same root word as first fruits. So God's very creation, you ready for this? Was his first fruits to us. He started the cycle of giving through the creation of the world and everything that we need. Oof. So we honor God with what we have and all that we do first in the same way that he did. And then our barns are filled with plenty. Right? That's beautiful. So let's go to Malachi 3, 8 to 11. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for your blessing, for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. This is, there's a lot in here. I'm just going to pull out a few really key things for us. First, this is the, tithing is the only place where the Lord literally says, test me. It says it right there. He says, try me now in this. See, he's saying, see if I don't bless you. Okay? So we, we need to test him. It's the only place where he lets us do it. Now, some say that this verse means if we don't tithe, we're robbing God. And, and maybe if we're no longer under the law, maybe we, we don't have to do this. Okay. We need to be really careful about this. When we think about the law, first of all, remember what Jesus said. Summarize the law in two important commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So we just learned that tithing is a way of showing love. So it is absolutely part of what Jesus is commanding in that sense, right? And also, Genesis 14, 19 to 20 says that Abraham tithed, not because he had to, but because he wanted to. And we are all heirs of Abraham through Christ, as it says in Galatians 3, 9. So we should be doing the works of Abraham. And in John, this is what Jesus says about this in John 8, 39. They answered, and Jesus said to him, If you are truly Abraham's children, then do the works of Abraham and follow his example. And Matthew 23, 23 implies that Jesus favored tithing, but not to the degree that the Pharisees thought. So look at this verse for a minute. Right? Because I, when, I, when I think about the law, one of the things I like to do is I, I want to see in the New Testament where the law is referred to. Because those are the things that I really want to keep in front of my mind. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So when he, what he's saying here is the Pharisees, of course, went way too far. They're like tithing everything. Like if you put salt on your food and somebody puts salt on your food, take a tenth of the grain out and put it in the poor box. It's crazy things like that. But when he's talking about the tithing, look what Jesus says in the last part of it. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. That is a very, very implicit 
direction that he did believe in tithing. So in addition to the other verse I gave you about love, he refers to it there. So it did, Jesus did support tithing even though he was rebu rebuking the Pharisees for taking it to such an extreme. Again, it's the hard question. By the way, first fruits, well, it really doesn't make, it's really not much faith to give after you have paid for everything else, right? So you want to give the first 10%. Okay. By, by the way, I also want to note that uh, churches so as well, right? So this is not just about us. King of Kings, very, very important. Sows into other ministries all the time. Um, that's something you, you want to keep in mind. This cycle is not just for us individually. It's for us as a church too. Now, the question I get a lot, should I tithe even if I'm deep in debt? Well, you shouldn't be deep in debt <laughs> to begin with, and we will talk about that, I promise. Um, but yeah, in some, the same principles that lead to abundance can get you out of debt. Um, so I would not use debt as an excuse, excuse not to tithe. Again, remember I said about the farmer, when he's in trouble, he doesn't start eating his seed. He puts more seed into the ground. Okay. All right, uh, let's move to Luke 6.38. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. I love this. Pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over, poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. So that repeats kind of what we've been saying, this cycle of blessing. But it also says you can't outgive God. So if you picture a jar of oats and you're pressing them down and now you can keep putting more in, um, and there are other things, too. By the way, your gifts will inspire other people to give, okay? When you are generous uh, in, in your life, you get other people to also want to be generous, too. They're like, oh, yeah, I want to be like that. And that adds to the blessing cycle. Okay. All right, I want to move to one question that I've got recently. Give me some reasons why <laughs> this is a question I got. Why it's more blessed to give than receive. Seems like a pretty obvious question. All right, so here's the four things to think about. One, when we give, we put God ahead of our selfish interests, and that obedience results in him blessing us. Two, giving protects us from greed and covetousness. Um, three, giving shows that we trust God and we're not living in fear. Four, when we give, we start this blessing cycle. We basically open a channel that God can give back to us. If we withhold giving, we withhold blessing. Anyway, principle 17. We should give cheerily and quietly. Amen. Now, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's remember that. Now, before we say to be too quiet, the word cheerful there actually means noisy and full of fun and laughter. So be excited. But when we say quietly, we mean something a little different, okay? It means more anonymously, right? So Matthew 6, 1 through 4, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the street that they may glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a deed, a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So we give anonymously, we give quietly, we, don't, we certainly don't give to show people anything. Principle 18. When giving, give generously, but so carefully in good soil. All right? This is very important, but don't use this as an excuse not to give, which I've seen people do. Okay. So either directly or through the church, let's go through a few scriptures on this. Proverbs 22, 9, he who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives his, of his bread to the poor. Proverbs 28, 27, 
He who gives to the poor will not lack, but he who hides his eyes will have many curses. So <clears throat> does this mean we should give to every beggar on the street? So we have to be careful and wise. Money in certain situations can hurt people, right? If we suspect that that money is going to be used by somebody to go, to go buy alcohol, that may not be the right thing. Um, I'll describe something that I used to do when I commuted into New York City. I used to put in my wallet, I don't know if they still have them, McDonald's gift certificates, do they still do that? That was a wonderful thing to do because I did not know what I was dealing with and I was afraid a little bit of putting money in bad soil, but I could always give a gift certificate to, to get a meal. Um, and I, I still think that's a, that's a really good way. So you, you want to pray and think carefully. Definitely pray in your giving situations um, how you can give wisely. Psalm 112.5 says, A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. So when we give to the poor, we fulfill uh, Galatians 6.2. We bear one another's burdens, and so we fulfill the law of Christ. And again, the verse 7, whatever a man sows, he weeps. Um, let's go to principle 19, the importance of proportional giving. So real quickly on this, and then we will be ending this soon. Mark 12, 41 to 44, Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. Many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came in and threw in two mites, which is like, uh, basically coins, which make a quadrant, which is basically like a penny. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of abundance, but she out of poverty put all that she had, her whole livelihood. So the point here is a simple one. It's proportional, right? You should be giving in proportion to what you're earning. How to receive... Um, I am going to just briefly talk about this because um, we've already covered some of these things. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read you one scripture. Haggai 1, 6 through 7. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. The Lord, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. This is about obedience, okay? Back to the other principles. You can, you can sow seeds till the cows come home. You can tithe all, every bit of income. But if you don't listen to the other, or look at the other principles we've talked about, obedience, uh, and all of those things, you're going to end up in that situation, and you may even wonder why it's happening to you. These principles are all linked together. You can't just say, well, I'm really good at tithing, so that's all I need to focus on. That's really important. That's the only thing. It's not the only thing. Okay. All right, so with that, um, I'm actually going to end it here. And I'm going to sum it all up with, with really one verse, which is what we started with. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all this will be given unto you. We can summarize, and if you put up at the end all 20 of those principles, that, really, that verse is really the key verse that does summarize all of this. Because all of these 20 principles are part of really the kingdom. And once we do that, then everything will be given unto you. So with that, let me open it up to questions real quickly. Next week, we're going to talk about things like budgeting, things like how to deal with debt, the myths that I talked about, uh, all of that. Oh, I did forget. We also want to take our, do our tithes and offerings. Since you heard a lot about it, this would be a good time to bring your offerings up to the baskets. There you go. There he is. What a joyful giver. That was a joyful giver. This is why you have no friends. No. Uh, <laughs> so text the word. You can also text the word give to 862-307-9226. You have a friend in me, and you know that. Wow.
You are so funny. 862-307-922. Oh, there it is. I said I was going to do it in the middle, and I, and I didn't. But you all got the message on tithing. So this is your chance to start the love cycle that we talked about. And I, I'm going to do questions and then pray us out, right? That's how we do it, right? So any questions about these principles? Or if there anything you particularly may want me to cover next week, I mean, you don't know what I'm going to talk about, but I am going to talk about, I'm going to be getting into details about things like car loans and credit cards and all of that good stuff. But the key is, if you don't have this stuff firmly embedded here, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen for you. Yes, I can talk about trusts. So trusts and wills. Oh yeah, I have something to say about them. Who does wills? A actually, I, yes, I can. I would tell you that if your will is simple, go to Mama Bear. It's online. You really don't need you really don't need an attorney for a simple will anymore. Up, so it's so it's on the microphone. Yeah. So the question was, recording. anyone to recommend a will? Come on up. MamaBear.com, I believe it is. Costs you three hundred bucks, I think. Let me see. Yes. Oh, now I'm nervous. <laughs> um. Okay. See that? I love that. She's relying on the spirit. And that was cool. It's all good. Come on up, Diane. Hey. Come on, come on. Yeah, it's... Don't forget. <laughs> so really quickly, and this kind of ties into... Sorry. Oh, gotcha. It ties into uh, possessing your vessel, but... What if there, and this might be more of a question for one of the deliverance ministers, like Pastor Easter to answer, which is how does um, performance orientation and trying to strive and do things yourself block the gifts that you could be getting from tithing? I don't know. If that's yeah, I mean, uh, Easter is probably a good person to go to, but I do think that if, if you have a performance orientation in your life, and you know you were receiving love because of the way things were in, in your household um, to to sort of in order perform. Then you have kind of a bad motivation for the actions that you're taking. So it absolutely can block you, right? And and also it will. I think when you take it to an extreme performance orientation, you are so busy trying to accomplish all of the things on your list that you're really not dealing with some of these heart issues, heart principles. That would, that would be my take, but you guys are maybe better able to answer that. That's good, it's okay. I, th I think it goes into trust as well, right? What's that? In, in the performance orientation, the lack of trust. Lack of trust. And trying to do yeah, it in your own good. strength rather than lack trusting of trust the of Lord, God. right? Yeah, it's a heart issue. No, no, stay up here. Heart issue. It's a heart issue. So. Um, you know, performance, you know, it's that need to be affirmed all the time. And, and it's that desire to always, you know, like pat me on the shoulder here and, you know, not doing it for the, with the right heart attitude. But as you are faithful in your giving and, and you're seeking the Lord, you know, and you're aware of it because you're bringing out the question, you know, then, you know, God will, he, he just supernaturally does what he does so well, brings healing to your heart. And so, but the thing is, like what Ron was saying, it's the key is choosing to obey the Lord, but then you have to recognize, wait a minute, am I giving out of fear? Because right. God's not going to bop you over the head either because God loves a cheerful giver, right? right? So he wants us to have the right heart attitude. So it's a process in learning and understanding. And, and, you know, and if a person has a tendency to be more in performance mode, then you have to then just, you know, say, Lord, I'm doing it. Because some people just give. Because, okay, if I do this, God's going to do this for me, right? right? Yep. And, of course, 
there's an aspect of that that is true, but it's like, Lord, I'm giving because I want to honor and obey you. The Bible says, if you love me, you obey my commands. So anyway, just wanted to add that to it. It's always back to love. It's always back to love. It, it, performance orientation is doing the right thing for the wrong reason. So if you're going to give to get, it's, it's what Pastor Trisha said, it's the heart issue. Also for next week, um, how to use our life insurance oh, yeah. on how, like, you know, people pay into it then people can borrow from it. And I heard the term that you can become your own bank, <laughs> like that. <laughs> That's number two. And number three is, like, how digital currency in our bank might affect, like, our money. I don't understand it. Like, Well, maybe, maybe briefly. I will cover... I will be covering life insurance as part of a whole risk management discussion. Um, and there's all kinds of messed up myths about it too. So I, I will hit on that a little bit. This concept of being your own bank is a little bit gimmicky, okay. but there's also some truth to it, which I will oh. talk about too. Okay. Um, just real quickly, I will hit the digital currency thing right now because I don't think that's gonna fit into next week okay. so easily. So the, the digital currency question is as follows, right? Everybody is concerned that if we eliminate paper money, then there can be complete government control over what we spend. You might wonder, how does that happen? Well, let's say you give to a cause that the government doesn't approve of, you can find out that your bank accounts could be shut out. Uh, I don't know if anybody caught it. It happened for a very brief period of time, but I believe it was PayPal. One of those, for a period of time, was fining people $200 if they were sending, quote, disinformation, which they determined. And if you wanted to, if you had a PayPal account, you, for a very brief period of time, they pulled it, uh, you lost $200. Okay, that's pretty scary stuff, right? Because that's in effect what a digital currency could allow. Now here's the bottom line on it. We already have digital currency. Everything I just told you can happen today. Right? You're not, unless you keep your entire wealth in cash, which I do not recommend, you, right now, whether it's your credit card, whether it's your bank account, if the government really wants to impose that, they already can. So don't act in fear. Um, and, and I would even tell you there are aspects of the digital currency that, that is, are beneficial. One of them is check clearing. Check clearing right now takes a ridiculous amount of time. How many of you have noticed when you deposit a check how long it takes to really clear your account? With a pure digital currency, that will be pretty much instantaneous if they go through with what they're talking about. Okay, so there, there are some good things about it. The bad things are real, but they actually could already happen today. For the most part, not 100%, but for the most part. So we need to be praying about those things, about the government behaving that way, and we need to be focusing on the thing, not so much the digital currency, because they already can do, do that. Yeah. Hold on. Come on, Richard. <laughs> So what do you think about keeping a little bit of silver, gold? Silver and gold, I have none. No, I'm sorry. But that, such as I have for you, I, felt like I, I will give to, to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I got you. I will tell you okay. how I think about it. So I, I know a, a guy I was talking to who literally put his entire life savings in gold. Now, wait, you say that's crazy. I asked him, I said, what is the probability of running into a situation, what do you think is the probability that we really are going to, things are going to be so bad in the world, not just the U.S., that that's going to be the wise, wise move? And he said a, a kind of a, a staggering number, 30%. That's really high, right? That's In, in a catastrophe scenario, a 30% number is like a foretailed thing. But that's what he said. So I said, so do you realize that in 70% of your outcomes, your strategy, you're going to be a loser? And he goes, well, I, I actually didn't think of it. So what, what's, what's the principle? You should not be managing your finances based on fear. Because 
that it, it can lead to some really wacky financial decisions. So the answer to your question is, there's nothing wrong with some silver and gold in your portfolio. You make it a portfolio allocation like anything else. Right. It will act as, an, as a nice hedge. There's, there's, there's maybe three years going back 100 where stocks, bonds, and gold didn't have a positive return, right? Having the, the combination of the three. By the way, 2022 was one of them. But what I'm saying is that, so it's a good asset allocation play, but that's a small allocation, not like huge numbers. And by the way, here's the thing to keep in mind. If you're really worried about complete global economic meltdown, everybody who's got gold, since you can't use gold in the supermarket, they're all gonna be selling at the same time. Trying to cash it in to be able to spend it and whatever value you thought gold had, when you have millions of people selling it in order to get liquidity, it's gonna plummet. So I don't recommend it as the savior of anything. There's only one thing we can rely on. One savior, one currency. No, no, I didn't say that. One heavenly currency. Ron, um, you talked before about uh, former seeds sown, and you said you said that some were bad and some were good. What's an example of a bad seed? What's a bad seed? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. So, I mean, a bad seed can be anything that you are pouring your resources into that is not consistent with the word, that is not kingdom-oriented, that is soulish in nature. It can be anything. It could be um, your, your son or daughter has an addiction and you give them money because they've asked you for it. That's a bad seed. So that, this is an example. Yeah, it's good. It could be anything. Betting on the New York Mets. No, no. <laughs> Very bad seed. Hello. So um, I kind of had like a twofold thing going on. I know you talked about resource allocations and not keeping your eggs in one basket. So um, that's kind of like the uh, worry of foresight or whatever. Like, um, and I guess that's really uh, relying on the Lord on it because you were talking about like, oh, you don't want to put everything on go. That's the 30% outcome, yada, yada, yada. And I know, I think um, even the government seized gold one time um, when our economy was going bad for a little while. Yeah, good year. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, uh, I guess, are you going to cover resource allocation uh, next week as well? And then my second question is, I don't want to know how to commit tax fraud, but I know there are right ways <laughs> to, um, to um, kind of give back what the government is overfeeding on us from. Is there places where we can go find that information? Or So I didn't quite catch that. Places where you can find what now? Uh, information on how to properly kind of combat anything that the government is kind of taking out of like our checks or anything like that, um, that we can kind of. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Oh, well, why didn't you say so? Oh. So the okay. word I think you're looking for is loophole. So, loop. So the first part loophole. of the question is, is really about optimal asset allocation, which I really am not going to get in. It's it's too detailed. But here's here's what I will tell you: the secret to good asset allocation is an outcome oriented oriented allocation. In other words, if you and most a lot of financial planners can do this for you. Not all of them, but a lot of them can. What they do is they do what are called Monte Carlo simulations, which are literally thousands of possible outcomes. You want to choose an asset allocation that will likely result in your having sufficient amount of means at, the, at your retirement age to be able to retire. I mean, that's, that's ultimately what you're trying to get to with a, with a long-term investment strategy. So the, the best way to do it is to through those, simu those simulations, you'll begin to see an allocation that makes sense. Now, you have to overlay on that your own 
risk tolerance issues. For example, if the, your portfolio is going to be working for you for 40 years, how do you feel about losing money in the stock market two, two or three years in a row? And you're going to say, oh, that's fine, that's 40 years. Some people say that, they don't mean it. Like when it happens, they're calling their advisor and they're saying, I lost 10, 20 percent in the market. What are you doing? Well, you said your risk tolerance was high. So sometimes people say things off the cuff. They don't actually mean them. So it's a balance of outcomes using Monte Carlo and then also um, um, your risk tolerance. Now, one more thing. Really, really, I'll tell you why I have a financial advisor, even though my financial advisor laughs at me. He says, you know more than I, what do you do? But I need him. Here's why I need him. Every, this is the same reason doctors don't operate on themselves, other than the physical problem of how do you do it. You get emotional with your own resources. We all do. So having a financial advisor who is, uh, who, who is not going to be able to be swayed when the market moves, but it reminds you of why you're allocated a certain way, it's really, really important. Okay, so I'm gonna tell people they should have a finance, we have financial advisors in, in the house, by the way, but I'm gonna tell people that it is important for that reason. So, allocation is outcome uh, oriented. Now, taxes was your other question. Um, it's probably too, too detailed to go here but there are fewer and fewer tax saving strategies than there used to be. Um, but what's the most important thing about saving money in your taxes is not so much while you're investing, it's when you pull it out. So when you get to the retirement age, it's the strategies for how you pull money out to avoid putting yourself in the next bracket. Those are important. So that's more that there is stuff you can do now, which I probably can't get into, but just as a general rule, that's when you really need good planning. It's how to take your money out once you have actually accumulated it. Yeah, that'll be $10. <laughs> that wasn't even worth that. <laughs> Cover which? Retirement? Well, in, in general, when I'm Yes, because one of the things I'm going to show you is how, you know, earning a fairly modest amount of money, you can over a lifetime be, have sufficient means to retire. So I think the example I might have used is $45,000 a year, like that you could actually retire with more than a million dollars in the bank and with Social Security could actually reasonably retire. So that is an example I'm going to use next week. But you got to follow the steps in order to kind of get there. Oh, her question was talking about retirement next week. So I will touch on retirement a bit. But I am writing these down. Anything else? Tom. Tom, come up. We need it on tape. And also we can send uh, Can you, you talk next week about what if you waited too late or ah. close to being too late? Too late. Like Is what can late? you do now, you know, at, at uh, over 60? Yeah. That's more difficult. <laughs> there are things you can do. Some. Obviously the longer... Are you familiar with Revelation chapter 13, verses 16, 17, 18, Mark of the Beast, how it's digital? And there is a platform that where we can purchase gold and silver collectibles. Are you familiar with 7K metals? With which Se metals? 7K metals. Is that, that's a, that's a commodity fund? It's a, where we can purchase gold and silver with. Yeah, yes. And it's, it's created by a believer, a Christian. Yeah. So 
there is that question, are you familiar with 7K medals? And also, are you familiar with the Mark of the Beast, Revelation chapter 13, no one can buy and sell unless they have the Mark of the Beast, and how it's extremely, extreme. it looks like it's digital. Yeah, I mean, it, it, look, it's, it's conceivable. It's conceivable that the Mark of the Beast is, is digital purchasing. Uh, but if we get to that point, cash won't be any good either. And having gold and silver won't be good either because you will not be able, if that really happens, that I promise you, in order to avoid theft and, and people buying illegal things, then even your gold purchases and sales will also be uh, digitally tracked. So I don't think you're going to be able to get around it. I just. What? Yeah. So there is the question is: Are you familiar with uh, states where you can barter with gold and silver? You can actually barter today, anytime, like right now, you can do it. My point is, uh, individuals doing that, okay, at a time when there was a, such a world crisis that the economy in the U.S. and globally is going to hell in a handbasket, then all of those things that sound really interesting, I personally don't believe is going to be as valuable a store of wealth as people are hoping it will be. So I, I'm just telling you that that's my view. What's that? Oh, so I'm not saying paper money is a good alternative either. I do think you have to put your money to work in a diversification of investments that does include some gold and silver. I'm just against putting large amounts of money in those things because you think that will ultimately survive when everything else crashes. I just don't believe that. That's one man's right. view. We're going to take one more question. Come on, Sam. However, bread will be very important either way. Sam, would you okay. take would you take a gold coin? For you, probably would. Would I take a gold coin? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the question is, um, would you be able to break down like how to really set a good budget for a family household based on certain income and so forth? I, uh, I a budget, a really good budget on how to, like, how to percentages, budget. yeah, a really a good so budget. I, I'm, I'm not going to give you, because it's too much to do in a talk, I I'm, can't really give you specifically too much on the budget itself, but I'm going to give you, like, some budgeting principles to think about. For example, one of the principles is that you should be budgeting every month particularly when you start. So when you get to the 28th, 7th, 28th, you should be creating your budget for the next month. And here's the key thing when you do your budget, and I will cover this, but when you do your budget, you have tremendous freedom to budget however you want. Ideally, you want to have enough money left over to, for savings so you can begin investing or paying down debt, depending on whatever else. But the key is, once you've created your budget with all the freedom that you want, now you're a slave to it. Now you're a slave to it. Do, do not bust your budget for any reason, okay? So you gotta think carefully, as specifically as you can. You're gonna do it every single month, and you're gonna have a lot of freedom, uh, but you're not gonna bust it. Now, I will say this, the first couple months, you, you, you need to have grace. Right, because you're not gonna. If you've never budgeted, you're gonna mess up the first couple months. So I'll give you two months to mess up, and you can you can even break it a little. But after that, you should have enough experience that you can create all of your line items so that you will not bust it. Gotcha. Yeah, but all the freedom to create it. That's the key to budgeting, by the way. Gee, you don't have to come yeah, next come week. On. Last Maybe question. I'll shorten that a little. Answer that 7K thing, yeah, that investment yeah. thing, dangerous. They, uh, it's a coin group, 
they're worldwide, they ask you what country you're from, they're selling silver at 35, right now it's going for 29. Okay. You want to stay away from that and go to like a real dealer. That's all. Okay. Thank you, okay. everyone. I'll pray thank you, Ron. Okay. So, Father God, we just, we just thank you for being the Lord of finances, Father. We, um, no matter how much we learn, no matter how much uh, counsel we get from others, we still know that you are sovereign. And Father, help us to remember to turn to you with our financial questions too. Pray about them. I think uh, we should be praying in this group about commodities. There seem to be lots of issues, so Father, we're gonna pray about that. Give us wisdom as it relates to gold and silver. Should there be more of it in our lives than we're thinking about? Uh, Father, you'd know the answers to these. So we pray about it. We thank you for what you've done here today in our hearts and our minds and the, the wisdom that you have given us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.